Sure. Like just a little bit, just so I can tell if he can hear.
Good evening. Welcome to my master's lecture estate, a combination of performance, presentation, and pedagogical insights gleaned and developed during my time in this unique master's program. Before I begin the presentation component of this recital, however, I would like to dedicate this program to Stephen Charles Sink, brother of a beloved mentor and my piano teacher in this master's program, Barbara Lister Sink. Stephen Sink passed away suddenly right before I was about to present this recital last year in December of 2021. In honor of his memory and for his family members, this recital is most lovingly dedicated. Now I will begin with the presentation components of this graduate lecture recital. And again, thank you all so much for being here with me this evening. From a very young age, I have always loved playing the piano. There is something very profound and indescribably special about expressing your soul literally at the tips of your fingers. There is a joy in freely giving of yourself and in communicating the deepest values of an, and of inspiring others through the art of music making. However, my path in music has been far from a smooth upward slope, to say the very least. Instead, it has very much felt at times quite insidious since I was beset with multiple injuries throughout my teens and 20s, which severely impacted and limited my ability to play the piano. One injury would recover with time, patience, training, and lots of physical therapy, only for another to suddenly burst onto the scene. Many times I felt desperately frustrated, tired and exhausted for what felt like a perpetual, never-ending series of bad luck. However, in the process, I have learned as, as both a performer and as a piano teacher, many things which I would not have otherwise had I not suffered the experiences I have gone through. In particular, I have come to value the unique role of a step-by-step, -step, scientifically informed and research validated approach to playing the piano, which not only has helped me in each situation back out of injury and return to playing, but which has over the years opened my eyes and ears to a range of musical expression and creativity that I would not have been aware of otherwise. In addition, I have come to realize through my experiences, both returning to play after an injury and in my work with my own piano students dealing with injuries, the crucial role of networking and furthering collaborations of musicians and performing arts educators with the medical profession and with certified hand therapists. With this in mind, there are three main goals which I have in the presentation component of this recital and throughout this program tonight as a whole. The first is to explain some of the principles of the lister -Sync method, which was very indispensable in backing me out of injury, and why it is such an important foundational tool and indispensable aid in helping musicians, not only for those dealing with playing, but also non-playing related injuries and helping keyboardists recover from both types of injuries. Secondly, I will discuss from my perspective and my own experiences with injury, ways of synthesizing physical therapy and other modalities with the process of learning a healthy, well-coordinated playing technique. Three, to briefly present my thoughts and my own personal experience dealing with the question of repertory selection and its vital role in the healing process while recovering from an injury. To begin with, we must keep in mind that there are two main categories of injuries to consider, which I just referenced in this slide proceeding. When, de when dealing with musicians' injuries, playing related insofar as the injuries were directly caused through the act of playing a musical instrument or singing, and non-playing related, injuries caused by other external factors not directly related to the act of playing a musical instrument or singing. My own personal injuries as a musician cover both categories, both playing and non-playing related injuries. My playing related injuries consisted of tendonitis and de Corvain's tenosynovitis in both hands and arms, starting when I was in high school and resurfacing on and off in my early to late 20s. These injuries developed through using a faulty, mal-coordinated, and biomechanically inefficient way of playing the piano. This image on the slide shows Barbara Lister Sink demonstrating in her landmark DVD, Freeing the Caged Bird, what a mal-coordinated way of playing the piano looks like. This image is very similar to how I used to play as a teenager in high school, and this helped cause my playing related injuries. And this, in fact, as Barbara Lister Sink has shown in her research, 
and work as a global leader in injury preventive keyboard technique highlights some of the particular patterns of malcoordination, which are actually very common among pianists and which in turn can over time facilitate what's called repetitive strain injury. For instance, pianists as pictured here will often chronically engage the medial deltoid or one of the upper arm muscles and hold the arms out to the side without releasing them, causing stiffness in the joints, notably the elbow joint, as you can see here with the extension of the arm out to the side. The neck is hyperextended and the wrist is often lowered, which over time can put pressure on the median nerve, one of the major nerves running through the arm. There are also many problems of co-contraction in the muscles of the forearms due to moving the fingers in isolation from the rest of the arm by, by, by tightly curling the fingers in. This, coupled with the highly repetitious nature of depressing thousands upon thousands of piano keys over a pianist's lifetime, results in these playing-related injuries, and certainly played a role in my own injuries that I experienced. Worse still, however, there has not been common consensus in the musical profession as how to prevent occurrence of what are called PRNDs, or playing-related neuromusculoskeletal disorders, among musicians, or of sound biomechanical models of well-coordinated and injury-preventive playing techniques customized to each instrumentalist. Ultimately, and most importantly, many playing-related injuries are caused by technical approaches which are not based on sound biomechanics as Dr. Wilshersink has shown. However, because playing the piano is one of the most complex motor skills, it is crucial that techniques of playing be used, which minimize the possibility of strain or injury, taking into account, as Dr. Wilshersink has shown, the artistic demands and the intense neuromusculoskeletal activity involved. And you can see this explained in great depth in her dissertation, which she published in 2015. With this in mind, and because in particular, the high rates of playing related injuries among pianists are still a perpetual problem in the music profession, with often one in two pianists developing an injury, Barbara Lister Sink, who is an internationally acclaimed piano performer and pedagogue, develops a distinctive method of a step-by-step, -step, well coordinated, injury preventive keyboard technique to help stem the tide of pianist injuries. This was inspired by her own history of playing related injury as an emerging performing artist. In 1995, she created a DVD titled Freeing the Caged Bird, developing well-coordinated injury preventive keyboard technique, which laid out the step-by-step -step methodology to enable free, effortless playing based on sound biomechanics. In the early 2000s, she developed a professional certificate, certificate program in well-coordinated injury preventive keyboard technique at Salem College. In 2015, her method became research validated through a thorough study in which participants confirmed that the method did successfully help them both recover and prevent reoccurrence of PRNDs. And once again, you can see this discussed in great detail in Dr. Wister Singh's dissertation, a study of students' perceptions of the effectiveness of an interdisciplinary method for teaching injury preventive piano technique. In 2016, Dr. Wister Singh started a unique master's program in piano performance and pedagogy with an emphasis in injury preventive keyboard technique, devoted to both retraining injured keyboardists as well as training future pedagogues how to teach the coordinations and sensations of injury preventive keyboard technique with the Lister Sync method. And this is, in fact, the very program for which I am presenting and performing the lecture recital this evening. While a thorough discussion of the Lister Sync method is beyond the scope of this particular presentation, there are a few key principles to keep in mind. The Lister Sink Method instructional, instructional Manual, as well as Dr. Lister Sink's own dissertation on her method, provides a very clear definition and rationale. Quote, the Lister Sink Method is a step-by-step, -step, rational, scientifically informed, accessible system for teaching the sensations and coordinations of healthful injury preventive keyboard technique from the foundational levels of sound production to the most complex kinetic patterns. End quote. And it is informed as indicated in this conceptual model from the results of the study validating her method and as shown in her dissertation, that this method is interdisciplinary in its approach, drawing upon the following disciplines, neuroscience and neuropedagogy, biomechanics, movement science and sports pedagogy, somatic education, such as the Alexander Technique and Feldenkrais, and it should be noted that the Alexander Technique in particular has been truly indispensable in helping 
injured pianists like myself develop very mindful kinesthetic awareness and thus progress very easily along learning this new method of returning to play. Technology-assisted pedagogy is also a part of these disciplines, including surface electromyography to sense muscle state, as well as injury preventive historical piano techniques. Additionally, there are important hallmarks of this method, which include the following. Efficient muscle use of the whole body, not just the arms, hands, and fingers, which in turn helps to facilitate non-accumulation of unnecessary muscle tension. It also includes optimal dynamic skeletal alignment, so making sure you are very well aligned while up at the piano. And three, it involves optimal use of the entire neuromusculoskeletal system. These hallmarks are truly the main foundational principles which help so many pianists like myself to recover from our injuries and return to playing at our previous levels. Retraining in the Lister Sync method was absolutely essential in facilitating my recovery from my playing related injuries and enabling me to return to play. As mentioned before, however, I do have the unique position of not only having had playing related injuries, but non-playing related injuries as well. In, two in 2017, I suffered several serious ligament tears in my right wrist from a dog bite to the hand, which caused a severe burning sensation in the wrist and required what is called an arthroscopic surgery to correct, coupled with extensive physical therapy afterwards. Then in 2021, I suffered another serious ligament injury along the fifth and fourth fingers of my left hand due to a very heavy suitcase being accidentally yet suddenly thrown onto that left hand. This particular injury being more recent, I have had to undergo quite a bit of physical therapy and I'm continuing at the present time my physical therapy and exercise regimen as I gradually return to my previous level of playing. While I am not yet fully recovered, I am moving onward one day at a time and progressing along the journey of gradually returning to my previous playing level. Now, while research has shown the efficacy of the Lister Sync method in helping pianists heal from playing related injuries, I have found from my personal experience that is, it is also effective in helping students heal from non-playing related injuries as well, an area of research that those of us who are graduating from this program or in the process of getting this master's degree in piano performance and pedagogy could keep in mind as an area of research to discover or to investigate more closely. And there's some of, there are some individual facets of this method which did help me in particular in healing from my non-playing related injuries. And you can see they do in fact relate to the previous slide with these hallmarks. So this optimal skeletal alignment with the focus on the whole body really helped facilitate a gradual healing of my ligament injuries by helping to minimize strain on the injured areas and not placing stress on them. The efficient muscle use, which is espoused by the method, did help prevent unnecessary muscular strain and tension, which in turn did help increase circulation and blood flow all throughout the body and in particular to the injured region, keeping the muscles and joints surrounding the ligaments released. This is particularly important, I would argue, in the case of a ligament injury, because blood does not flow as readily to ligaments as it does to muscles and other kinds of soft tissue, which in turn can make the healing process for ligaments, as has been the case with my situation with both injuries in my right and left hand, a much, much longer process. So all the more reason to really make sure that you are getting that circulation by not unnecessarily tightening those muscles. And this is where the Lister Sync method has really helped me with this process of trying to recover from these non-playing related injuries. Finally, the whole arm coordination approach of the Lister Sync method made it easier for me to adjust to repertory or changes in repertory, including changes of fingering that I had to make, etc., to make it possible to still learn certain pieces I want to play while recovering from an injury. So definitely it could be said that the Lister Sync method does help you all the more in this process of improvising, adapting, and overcoming your injury while still making the necessary adjustments to your repertory. This brings me to the next point of this lecture tonight, the vital role of synthesizing physical and occupational therapy with an injury preventive approach to piano technique. As those of us in this master's program know, this necessitates knowing how to look for the best healthcare professionals who will properly diagnose the injury and provide effective, not futile treatment options particularly if physical therapy is needed in one's treatment plan in healing from an injury. One of the big questions I have often thought about is the following, an area again for future research. How do you synthesize effective modes of therapy with a gradual return to playing with well-coordinated injury preventive keyboard technique? 
while it could easily itself be the focus of yet another presentation, I will just provide some brief insights I acquired over the past year through working with two different physical or occupational therapists, who I should also add are also certified hand therapists. And in particular, if you do have a hand, arm, or shoulder injury, do look for that credential um, CHT, Certified Hand Therapist. It's something that I have realized is absolutely essential to look for when you are treating an issue of dysfunction of the arm, shoulders, or hands. And there are several things you have to look for in the therapist that you are looking for to help you heal from this injury. One is to make sure that the therapist that you work with is not only made aware of the distinctive biomechanics you use, you use as a pianist, especially this distinctive biomechanical model of playing in which you employ well-coordinated injury preventive keyboard technique. But the therapist should also show an openness to learning more about the Lister Sync method and in customizing your treatment plan to the specific demands of your technique and of the instrument. Secondly, the pianist should demonstrate their playing both on an instrument, but also preferably on the arm or shoulder with the permission, of course, of the physical therapist. I've personally found when dealing with injuries that doctors or therapists are not always as aware of the specific goals you need to meet in terms of transferring force easily and effortlessly into the key as a pianist until they actually get not just a visual sense of what you are doing at the piano, but also a tactile sense. This technique whereby I will just go ahead and ask the therapist, do you mind if I just demonstrate my playing on your arm or on your shoulder? And if they say yes, I do so. And then they have a much better sense kinesthetically of what I'm actually doing as a pianist. And this has helped some of my own therapists to tailor my treatment plans to the goal of actually returning as much as possible to the activity of piano and keyboard playing. A very important point, because often therapists and doctors tend to not measure recovery of the patient based, based on how well you can play the piano, but more generally on the patient's ability to do simpler tasks, such as grasping an object or opening a door. Again, they're not always aware of the more complex motor skills of the pianist and of keyboardists in general. And it is your job as a pianist to make sure that they are aware of this difference. Thirdly, there should be an openness on the part of the therapist if a particular treatment plan does not appear to be working as well for the patient or for the injured pianist to be willing to shift gears to change the treatment regimen and possibly even try or recommend other soft tissues, tissue modalities which may help. This would include not just traditional therapies like physical and occupational therapy, but also massage and myofascial release, as well as what's called active release technique or ART, acupuncture, etc. Among these, I have personally found with my own injuries, both playing and non-playing related, that myofascial release developed by John F. Barnes, who has a website describing this particular approach to soft tissue in detail. I found this to be a particularly effective. Myofascial pain syndrome has been covered in literature dealing with musicians' injuries, but a focused investigation of how trained myofascial therapists may help pianists recover much faster from their injuries remains to be done. Again, another area of research to consider. Finally, and most importantly, ideally the therapist should be able to help suggest a plan in coordination with one's piano teacher, which helps combine any necessary therapeutic exercises with the act of playing the piano. In so doing, piano the playing becomes an integral, integral part of and a kind of therapy. I'm going to provide an example of what this looked like in my own case. Do be aware that this particular treatment protocol was customized to my own injury situation and should not be arbitrarily copied without personal work and advice with a therapist. In this regard, for my own personalized treatment plan, an occupational therapist and certified hand therapist from the Philadelphia Hand to Shoulder Center, Terry Skirvin, has been a tremendous help, proving that the collaboration between musicians, therapists, and doctors is incredibly helpful in this process of returning to play. In the case of my left hand injury, which Terry primarily worked on with me, she recommended a return to play sequence schedule and tracking form. Right now we're looking at the schedule right here, but we'll look at the tracking form in a moment. And this would be coupled with carefully sequenced playing at the piano, combining playing at graduate levels with hand therapy and the well-coordinated playing technique all working together with each other to facilitate healing. So she and I both worked together, providing feedback as needed, and tweaking these forms as needed based on my and the needs of my particular treatment plan as a musician and as an injured pianist. So right here on the screen is an example of the return to play schedule that I followed. 
What you can see here, first of all, in the, the left column on the, on the left side there, are different levels, or three to seven days, you can see there, so the duration of time, and different levels of playing. And there will be gradual increases in the amount of playing every three to seven days, and gradual decreases in the amount of rest in between. So starting out, level one, over a course of three to seven days, I would be playing for five minutes on a given day. I would then rest my hands for 60 minutes or a full hour. And then this would be followed by five more minutes of playing. And this is all I would do, just 10 minutes of playing a day for that first three to seven days. Level two then gradually increases the amount of playing by five minutes each day and decreases the amount of rest by, by, by five minutes. And you can see right here, or by 10 minutes rather, and this example here shows that with level two, the playing would increase by five minutes to 10 minutes a day, followed by rest for 50 minutes, and then another 10 minutes of playing. So increasing the playing with this next level two to 20 minutes a day. And this would just continue with each level. And we would just monitor my injury very closely. If at any point I was suffering more pain at a certain point in a given week, we would just go ahead and back off and go back to the previous level. So it was very easy to monitor the injury and go back and forth as needed and progress very, very gradually in this process of returning to play while also healing from the injury with therapy. With the return to play tracking form, my playing became coupled with a very carefully sequenced therapy regimen. And this became all the more apparent to me throughout my work together with Terry. This example shows that I would start out the therapy session of the day with heat therapy. And then I would, after that, include some natural abduction and adduction of the, of the fingers. So a nice, a, a nice light and easy stretch after doing that heat therapy for about 15 minutes. After this, I would do some light massage on my hand, on the injured area, as directed by my therapist, and I should add as demonstrated by her. This would be followed up by what my therapist called pantomime play. While I do not personally use the same term, basically what this meant was simulating the act of playing while not actually playing on the instrument. And keep in mind that this particular detailed tracking form is for level one. So at those first three to seven days, when you're just playing for 10 minutes a day. So pantomime playing could include mental practice, which I did quite a bit of in the early stages of my injury, sitting down and just watching a video of well-coordinated injury of keyboard technique, and also simulating the act of playing if I could with my hands. And this actually would be progressively employed in a, in a specific manner. So you see here on the right side, some splint padding right there, very light foam, which is used a lot in therapy. And this is where what I actually started doing was actually pretending to play on the splint padding, still having a nice surface to use, while simulating playing, and yet it was very soft, meaning less impact on the hand, and as such was not aggravating the injury. And so from here, we progress to different levels of pressure or different key pressures. So I would do the splint, pad splint padding and then progress to a lighter keyboard touch and then eventually progress to the weight of the modern grand piano. Since with my injury initially, I couldn't handle the key weight of the grand piano itself. I had to progress up to it very gradually with graduated levels of pressure. This process of the therapy will be followed by ice and rest to conclude a first set of therapy that day, which as you can see would combine some playing or simulated playing in this case uh, with the therapy exercises. And this will be followed by a second set later that day. With each week of the program, again, with those different levels of graduated um, lengths of playing, the therapy exercises would change as would the playing duration and graduated level of my piano repertory in which I would carefully monitor the injury always so as not to provoke symptoms of pain and ultimately, my physical therapy became a technique of returning to play, and the piano technique became a kind of therapy, both working together hand in hand with each other. And this process and methodology for me, coupled with the Lister Sink method, had very good results in my process of returning to play my instrument. And I must emphasize that it was so crucial to have the Lister Sink method throughout this process, because if I'd been engaging in a mal-coordinated way of playing the piano, I would only have exacerbated my injury, no matter how much therapy I was doing. The final point of this lecture tonight is the question of repertory selection. Once again, a topic which could be covered in a presentation all of its own. One of the biggest psychological challenges in the process of recovering from an injury and regaining one's pianistic voice is the feeling of inadequacy and frustration because the feeling like you are, quote, downgrading your repertoire and sacrificing your previous level of musicianship. First of all, it must be noted that an injured pianist is not in any way, shape or form sacrificing musicianship. On the contrary, he or she can find new ways of developing it, even while recovering from an injury. 
And one thing to keep in mind that, that the pianist, the injured pianist can try would include mental practice, the process of envisioning oneself playing the piece, including ones that you actually do really want to play. This can keep you musically stimulated, but also give you some hope, thinking about the future and your ability to eventually play those pieces again. And it's also a wonderful thing to do from an in imaging perspective. So neuroscience shows that the act of thinking about playing can in turn enables us to actually practice. I always tell my piano students, when you do your mental practice, you are not taking a step back, you are still moving forward with this process of learning a piece of music. It's always, always moving forward, even with mental practice in that process of developing a new way of playing any piece that you want to play. Secondly, you need to consider that a lot of times injured pianists may want to do musical, pa musical practice, which may not involve the instrument one primarily performs on, coupled with ergonomic considerations. So in my case, I am a smaller handed pianist. And as a result of this, the modern piano size and the modern piano key width does not work the best for my hand. And in fact, playing, let's say an octave or even a ninth can put my hand into a little bit of hyperextension. And you can see this here actually with the image on the left. So you see a smaller hand in the lower part of that image playing on a standard keyboard size with a standard key, key width. And you can see that thumb in hyperextension with that hand right there. So the hand is extended like that. But then when you look at the small hand playing on a smaller size instrument, in this case a 1516 keyboard, where the key width is slightly narrower, you can see that that hand is so much more in proper alignment without that thumb being hyperextended. This question of ergonomics, as well as being willing to practice on different instruments, is really crucial to consider. In my case, certainly, because my injuries have been such that excessive extension of the hands or abduction would really flare up the injuries, it was crucial to consider changing to other kinds of instruments in this process of recovering from the injury, and so ergonomics was a huge issue to consider in this case. Thirdly, one should consider a careful repertory selection, something which I will return to in a moment, repertory which sequences this process of gradually returning to injury or, or gradually returning to playing while not aggravating the injury itself. And finally, musical engagement is the most important factor. It is important to keep the injured pianist and keyboardist musically engaged, even throughout the recovery process from an injury. This can be done. It absolutely can be done by finding various pieces, including those, by the way, which can vary stylistically while still not provoking the injury at hand. It is a crucial challenge which all pianists and graduates of this program will face as they prepare and advance keyboard students to higher levels of repertory while helping them recover from injury. One of my personal goals um, when I enter my PhD program is to consider possibly creating on um, a database, one which would actually incorporate a vast range of pieces and showing different categories of them and how you can customize different levels of repertory um, to one's particular recovery and stage of injury in that process of healing from it. Now, there are some very important questions to consider with repertory selection. So again, I'm returning to that initial point, um, which I thought I would return to there with careful repertory. It's important to ask the following questions. Does the piece in question that an injured pianist is working with have any techni technical issues which could exacerbate the injury, such as thick chordal textures, extensions, abduction of the hand, any repetitive patterns or figurations which, figurations which could cause pain? Or is there an inability to refinger a physically troubling musical passage to make it not cause any pain. Can an injury preventive keyboard technique with the whole arm coordination help solve these challenges? Or is the piece itself too problematic, technically, at a given stage of recovery from injury? If so, it is important to be psychologically willing, both on the part of the teacher as well as of the injured pianist, to change up one's repertory or make adjustments as needed to repertory that one is working with. And of course, most importantly, again, is the piece musically stimulating for the injured pianist? Again, I do say that it is definitely possible to find pieces, even ones that feel much simpler, um, that can still stimulate the musicality of the injured pianist and keep them moving along that path of developing their unique musicianship while recovering from injury. Their musicianship does not have to stop with an injury. And in fact, they may find it going into avenues they would not have expected had they not had the injury in the first place, gearing them towards certain types of repertoire they might not have tried otherwise. And for now, what I will do at this point is switch out of the PowerPoint and provide a very brief demonstration in this regard of repertory selection of some of the pieces I selected for tonight's program and how they helped me with this particular healing process.
So I will begin by showing the very first piece I will open my program with tonight, which is on the Scarlatti Sonata in A major, K322. And this sonata was very helpful for me. It actually was one of the first pieces I was working on um, as I was actually, well, I should actually preface that with having done mental practice first. It was one of the very first pieces I started working on after my simulated playing in the first part of that level of therapy. And this piece was really helpful for me because of the fact that it does have that simpler solo bass line, which did help me tremendously because I could easily refinger it and not put pressure on this side of the hand, which was where the fourth and fifth finger injury occurred. So basically I could take this very easy line See, I am able to use my fourth and fifth fingers, but initially I could only use my first, second, and third fingers with the sonata, but I was able to do so. This was a case of just very simple refingering, which still enabled me to play this piece at hand. The same thing was the case as well, um, or actually not quite the same way, but with the next Scarlatti sonata I'll be playing tonight, the one in F minor um, and F19, this particular one I was able to do as well because it didn't involve major abduction or extensions in the hand. And initially, when there were a few chords that were a little hard for me to handle, I just customized the playing to my own situation and left some notes out for the time being with the motivation of gradually adding those notes in as I was recovering from the injury. Next, of course, my Haydn Sonata, uh, which Hoboken 1646, which I'll be playing the first movement tonight just for the sake of time. This sonata also was really helpful because, again, it did not exacerbate the injury in the left hand and did not fall, involve extensive um, abduction or contraction. And this was actually really helpful for me too because there was one section in particular with the broken octaves in the exposition, which if I'd been playing with a mal-coordinated technique would certainly have really flared up my injury. But because I was using the Lister Sync method with a whole arm coordination, I was able to play it very easily in a matter which did not cause unnecessary abduction from the fingers. So I'll just show you a brief example of that here. <laughs> So what you can see there is that instead of going like, extending the hand, fingers out like this and going really sharply back and forth, I was able to use a whole arm coordination with the Lister Sync method. In this case, using the whole arm structure to guide the motions of the lower arm, hands, and fingers. In this manner to avoid unnecessary extension at the area that I was injured in, in the hand, and thus still be able to play this piece without exacerbating the injury. So again, a very clear cut and excellent example of how using the Lister Sync method of whole arm coordination and how it helped me with playing this particular piece, even with those broken octaves in the left hand. Of course, I'll be moving on tonight as well to play some Scriabin as well as some Bartok. And I will say too, what was wonderful for me was the opportunity with these pieces, even though at the time they felt to me a bit simpler, were to really help me engage in different types of styles and also different affects and moods as I was playing, especially with the, dark, the deep depth and soulfulness of the Scriabin and this beautiful harmonic coloration that you get out of it. I found it, especially in the preludes, incredibly helpful. And I would recommend, by the way, for those who are teaching this method, definitely consider looking very closely at the Scriabin preludes. There are a whole selection of pieces that you can choose from and customize to various types of um, injured pianists, including those who may have some injuries more prominent in one hand versus another. Definitely there are many preludes out there that you can use that will have the figurations which will not exacerbate the injury. And then moving on from that, I did progress eventually to playing pieces which did have more dynamic contrast. So definitely initially I could not play at a very loud volume because that would involve putting a lot of force uh, through the fingers into the keys and that would in turn have exacerbated my injury. But eventually in this process of returning to play, again progressing through those various levels, I was able to play some Bartok where you do have some incredible um, dynamic contrast, harmonic contrast, a wonderful chance to experience a mixed meter in there as well. Um, I would add in particular that I definitely was very musically stimulated by what I'll be playing tonight, the Romanian Christmas carols, uh, which have quite a fascinating story. Bartok himself, the ethnomusicologist that he was, um, went out and actually in Romania, went to various regions and collected different um, Christmas carols celebrated by different individual communities, and then put them together beautifully harmonized and arranged in this wonderful set. And I'll be playing that first series tonight. So it was very musically stimulating. I couldn't play it initially in the, the first stages of my retraining and my process of recovering from the injury, but it was a later stage of pieces to perform, which were more challenging for me in terms of the dynamics and also in terms of the range of articulations that I had to deal with. 
But once again, having that injury preventive keyboard technique was crucial for me because if I'd been using a very tight, mal coordinated method of playing, I would have been tempted with the intensity of the bar talk to really tighten up and play especially the articulation in a very stiff manner and as such actually exacerbate the injury. So once again, that wonderful um, listening method really helped me tremendously in keeping everything nice and free with easy, efficient movements to facilitate healing and avoid injury, even as I was progressing through various stages of repertory with the bar talk. And finally, finally, last but not least, I do look forward to sharing with you tonight um, an improvisation that I worked on. One of the things I've realized with any kind of injury is that if you are having trouble finding a piece that really fits your needs while you're injured, why not improvise? Why not compose? Why not, again, find an area of creativity that you can explore with yourself as a musician that you might not have tapped into otherwise? So in this regard, I tapped into my musicological background in medieval music and plain chant and decided to create an improvisation on one of Hildegard's beautiful Marian responsories, which I'll explain a little bit more um, towards the end of the, of the program tonight. But this was a way of customizing the playing and the figurations to my injury and avoiding certain figurations which could cause pain while just adapting the piece specifically to my own level of playing at that point with the injury. So again, improvisation and composition, some areas that you can explore as an injured pianist that you might not have otherwise had you not had your injury in the first place. So just to conclude with, I wanna emphasize some really important points here. Having just one or two injuries which restrict, limit, or prevent a musician from being able to perform and express a distinctive level of musicality can in and of itself be emotionally debilitating since it does block the vital ability to communicate one's musical soul. No one, and I do mean this emphatically, no one truly knows what is, it is like to have unless they themselves have gone through it, especially when, as in my own case, prior injuries resurface or freak accidents occur completely beyond one's control, creating new injuries, which in turn throw you back into what feels like an endless abyss of pain and dysfunction, when all you want to do is communicate your unique musical soul and develop the highest levels of musicianship. There is a whole complex, complex of emotions the injured musician may go through, ranging from mild feelings of inadequacy and isolation, all the way up to full-blown depression and suicidal thoughts. This is why this highly distinctive master's program exists, to train pianists and keyboardists not only to perform, but also to develop their unique pedagogical skills, conveying the principles of injury prevention and of the Lister Sync method to their own students, so as to allow those musical voices to never be stifled permanently. And in this manner, they can become a beacon of hope for many injured musicians. In my case, those of us teaching this method have to remember as teachers of well-coordinated injury preventive keyboard technique and of the finest levels of musicianship resulting from that, that there is power in resilience. Each one of us as teachers has a story, which perhaps will aid and assist other musicians in ways perhaps it would not have had we never had our own trail of injuries to begin with and our pain or dysfunction, which in most cases may have caused us to seek out injury preventive keyboard technique in the first place. Ultimately, I hope to encourage all struggling pianists, keyboardists, and quite frankly, all musicians for that matter, never to quit, no matter how difficult your situation gets when you are in a state of injury, whether it is playing related, non-playing related, or as in my case, both. Realize that a well-coordinated injury preventive technique is crucial to your recovery process. Be willing to make your instrument a vital part of that healing process. Make the instrument your therapist and your friend, and certainly not your adversary, even if you cannot play for a time the pieces you so desperately wanted to. Furthermore, if due to injury you need to psychologically, scare quotes, downgrade your repertory for a time, how do you find ways of helping your musicality grow and develop, despite the frustrating roadblock, roadblocks you encounter with injury? Even if it means something as simple as focusing on mental practice for a time, it can be done. You can find a way to keep your musicality developing and growing and keep everything musically stimulating for yourself. At the end of the day, it must be remembered. Every step is heroic, every note is heroic, and the ability to live through every setback and come through it all is heroic. Hopefully in your journey to injury and recovery, we will be able to help ourselves and our students tap into a deeper level of musical depth than they would have otherwise helping to foster an incredibly rich new approach in the next generation of music making and of keyboard pedagogy. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation tonight. And after this brief intermission, I do look forward to seeing you again for the performance component of this lecture recital.
as mentioned previously, on Hildegard von Bingen's responsory Ave Maria o Ockrit Vitae, which translates to Hail Mary, Author of Life. This actually was inspired partly by my master's thesis, which focuses very closely at instances of what's called musical intertextuality, or cases of quotation, in which Hildegard actually in fact does quote pieces outside of her repertoire, and actually incorporates these quotations in her music in very innovative ways, thus proving Contrary to a lot of research which has um, previously indicated that Hildegard was very isolated in her, in her community, actually, in fact, in fact, is not true. She did, in fact, have quite, um, quite a relationship with the music outside of her community. And in fact, as um, Jennifer Bain, the advisor who I've worked with, has shown, she does exhibit some incredible characteristics of what's called a late Germanic style of plain chant, one which has those beautiful um, ranges in the music and the octaves that you see with Hildegard's own music and that beautiful ethereal aspect to much of her playing chant. So tonight I'll be playing an improvisation on this particular Brarian responsory, uh, which by the way is um, it's a chant from the Divine Office um, that will be recited at Matin, so the first hour of the, of the Divine Office early in the morning. 
And response reads is known for being um, a very complex kind of chant, very melismatic, so a lot of notes set to a single syllable in a lot of cases. Unlike an antiphon, which is a shorter chant and often um, simpler in its um, musical form and expression. But um, response reads like these can be very elaborate. And what's fascinating is that actually um, Barbara Thornton, um, a venerable member um, who has since passed uh, with Sequencia, the renowned medieval ensemble, and whom actually Marvel Tristan herself actually knew, uh, this, this particular performer, or I would like to call scholar performer, actually was one of the first to note that it's very likely that Hildegard, in writing this particular responsory, was very much inspired by another very famous um, 12th century Marian votive antiphon of that time, the Amor Redemptoris Mater, or Hail, Kind Mother of the Redeemer. And in fact, as I myself have worked through and analyzed this particular responsory, I have to agree with Barbara Thornton. And she said, and I paraphrased her slightly here in an interview one time, that it is very much the case that Hildegard is basically embroidering, as she called it, um, over the previous material written in the Almer and Mater. So again, another instance which Barbara Thornton argues is a case of some musical crossover or in the more formal context, intertextuality or some musical citation going on. So what I'll be doing with this improvisation, a very short ending to this program, but one which will incorporate um, some of the main melodic ideas of um, both the opening of Ave Maria o Auschwitz Vitae, so Hildegard's responsory, coupled with the opening of the 12th century vote of Mary Antiphon, Almer de Prus Mater, one that was quite famous in Hildegard's day and one with, whom she, with which she would have been quite familiar. So I hope you enjoyed the ending uh, piece here. Again, it was inspired by my situation with injury, trying to come up with some improvisation, and it did stretch me in an area that I might not have otherwise, and now I teach my own students to try to engage in improvisation, even if they're not injured. So I hope you do enjoy this little improvisation on Hildegard's Mary Responsory, O Ave Maria, O Altrix Vitae.
this evening. Thank you for joining me for this lecture recital. I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care.